you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God cause all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able oh I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice you have led me through the fire in darkest nights you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God. Hey, cause all my life you have been faithful. Oh yes, you have. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath, with every breath that I am able. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, is running after me. Your goodness is running after, is running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything, oh Lord, your goodness is running after, it's running after me, your goodness is running after, it's running after me, your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Everything, oh Lord. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. In all my life, you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I'm gonna sing of the goodness of God I'm gonna sing All my life you have been all my life you've been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath, with every breath that, that I am able Every breath that I'm able I will sing, I will sing of, the of the goodness of God, God. Yes, I, am. I will sing, I will sing of the goodness of God, I will sing of the goodness of God. We're going to look at Psalms, the 77th chapter, and we're going to look at every verse, maybe, not all the verses, but most of them. We'll probably go down to 15. Um, when we're when we having those different areas of trouble, uh, we can be in trouble so long that it feels like the trouble has gotten a hold of us. 
and we don't know what to do. But whatever we call it, whether we call it mess, whether we call it obstacles, whether we call it situations, what we call it a dilemma. So we have some nice words for our mess, for the stuff, don't we? For our trouble, amen. Whether we say, I'm just having a problem. And a lot of times we'll give hint to it. Girl, how you doing? Oh, I'm just having a problem today. Or I'm having a situation. Reminds me of that commercial. I'm having a situation. <laughs> but yes, you are. <laughs> but, you know, no matter what we call it, he still can intervene in our situation, in our mess. Amen? Because we're going to hold on and do what the word of God says. Let's look at Psalm 77. The first verse says, I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice, and he gave ear unto me. Now here the psalmist is saying that in your, midst of, in your day of trouble, that's what we need to make sure we do. This Psalms might start out looking like it's kind of sad, but he did the right thing in the beginning. He cried into the Lord. He didn't go get Susie to cry, and he stayed silent. He cried. So Asaph cried unto the Lord, even unto God with my voice, and he gave ear unto me. Didn't God say he'll hear I cry? One lovely thing I love about babies is, new, especially newborns, they get away with everything. They so cute. We don't beat them. We don't do anything because they smell good and cute. And they're so cuddly. And that love that they give out, mm, it's so precious, isn't it? But till they cry. And when they cry, guess what? They know how to do it. So, if our God uses examples of children and babies a lot in scripture, I think we need to maybe grab hold of that. Because when a baby cries, maybe your babies didn't, but mine's did. Guess what? I was moving. And you get to learn to cry. So God knows our cries. He knows our every cry. But when those babies cry, we move forward. We are there to take care of whatever the need is. It doesn't matter what the need is. We figure it out because they can't communicate other than the crying. So we assist them or give them what we feel like they need or want. So we'll try to bottle. Ooh, maybe it's some food they need to we learn to cry. Oh, it's some food they need. So we give them food. And then sometimes the baby's still crying. Then we check the diaper. And then we see that there might be a little mess there. So we take care of that. And then sometimes they just want our time or an embrace from us. Amen? And so we pull them up close, and they get to hear the heartbeat. And that gives them the answer to soothe and calm right on down. And sometimes they just want to smell you. Because I know my mama. When I'm, I don't matter where my mama at. You can throw me in a room with a ton of babies. I'm going to know my mama's voice. I'm going to know her smell. I could be blind and still know my mama and my, by her smell and by her voice. And God knows our voice. He hears our every cry. Amen. But a baby won't stop until the need is met. Can we continue to cry out to God? He doesn't mind. He says for us to cry out to him. And when we cry, I don't know about you, I'm not a crier. It's a couple things that make me cry. One is funerals, which is a normal. But the other one is when somebody takes advantage of somebody. It makes me so, I won't say mad, because that wouldn't be a, a, a pastor wife word. <laughs> it makes me so concerned that when somebody takes advantage of an elderly person or a young person, it hits hard in the core. And the other one is somebody is an intentional, well, I won't say intentional, because you're lying, you know you're lying, and et cetera, so it's intentional. <laughs> <laughs> but if somebody just out here sowing discord, gossiping, et cetera, that, that to me is I have a problem with you. I won't cry outward. I might cry on the inside because... 
my flesh want to do something that my heart saying not to. Because they need to stop. And you want to say some words that I'm not one that would give, use ever. I never use profanity. But I can give you a few harsh words that I can find in the Bible with a little tone to it because you need to stop. But am I just wanting you to stop just for the stop? No. Because it's wrong. And you're not getting it. And you're hindering your prayers and you got to answer to God. So that's what the whole purpose is. And sometimes we, we don't see something as simple as gossiping or sowing discord as sin, but it's sin. We think, oh, I'm just dis having a discussion. You're not having a discussion. It is sin. Amen? Amen. Glory to God. So we, give a, we, um, we cry out to the Lord in our time of trouble. And here we're seeing that there's a need for an answer. Those babies cry out to us for help. Here, we need to cry out to God in the time of trouble. Because if we don't get that out of our bodies, it will cause physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual challenges later on in life. Amen? If you don't know, um, a lot of cancers, a lot of uh, high blood pressures, a lot of uh, mind issues, nerve issues, have to do with to suppressing a lot of things in our bodies that we shouldn't uh, hold on to. And if we don't let, let it go, like we see here, it will settle in your cells, and it will bring about a change. And that change can cause you some serious issues in life, and sometimes some things don't get reversed. So we want to do what the Lord says, cry out, get it out, place it at the feet of our Father, amen? Because he has the answer. He knows the beginning from the end, so he knows all about whatever situation we're in, and he'll make sure we get the answers that will settle everything, amen? Second verse says, in the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My sword ran in the night and ceased not. My soul refused to be comforted. So here we're looking at that day of trouble again. In my day of trouble, I went before the Lord, and I ceased not. I didn't stop going before God about this situation. I'm going to hang right in here, and I'm just going to believe God. I'm going to speak his word. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to pray I'm going to receive his word. I'm going to rejoice and praise him. Amen? Amen? And that praise is a good part, a good place to go. Because with praise, you're releasing. And you're, you're, you're surrendering all of that. That's a part of your faith, too, as well. Because we can praise. If you can praise God in the midst of a situation, that means you're releasing that situation. You're not holding it on, on to it. And your body needs to break. Your mind needs to break from that. Because it says, my soul refused to be comforted because it, your mind is going to tell you, oh, no, it's, it didn't happen. Because you go to bed with it, you get back up with it. We got to let it go. Because we cannot allow it to rob our sleep. Because if you allow it to rob your sleep, then you got another issue. You're, it's an open door for physical challenges and health challenges in our body. It says on the third verse, I remember God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. And sometimes we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna get there and we're gonna say, well, God heard me. Did he is he listening to me? And you start complaining. And your spirit could get overwhelmed because it's not happening as fast as you thought it was gonna happen, or the way you thought it was gonna happen, or when you thought it was gonna happen. And sometimes it looks like it's worse. And sometimes it is worse than it was. But the whole thing of that is the enemy wants you to back up on your relationship with God and cave in. But we're not. Amen? Fourth verse says, and we're going to come back to it again and add some more points to it as well. It says, thou holdest my eyes waking. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. We can be so weighed down by the, the troubles that we have, that it 
holds us hostage in the night season because our mind is gonna play it over and over and over. And all the challenges that we've had during the year or the month or the day, he'll continue to play it over and over and over. And then those troubles and those fears are just, just being uh, running back and forth in our hearts and in our minds. But we need to surrender it all. And it says in the fifth verse, I have considered the days of old, the years of ancient time. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune with my own heart and my spirit made diligent search. So we have to remember the victories. All the times that he's delivered you before. You had your wilderness experience. You've had your Red Sea experience. Amen. Where he parted the water and made a way. Amen. Where it didn't look like you were going to make it out because you kept going around and around and around, but you still held on, and God delivered you. Amen? And then the seventh verse says, Will the Lord cast off forever, and will he be favorable no more? In his mercies, it is, excuse me, is his mercies clean, gone forever? Does his promise fail forevermore? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his tender mercies? Selah. We can get in our mind and say, Lord, where are you? How long, Lord? How long? How long? I'm waiting, God. I'm waiting on you. I'm waiting on my breakthrough. I'm so troubled. I'm so weighted down, oh God. I'm not getting any sleep. And when you don't get sleep, it's a different world. You can wake up everybody in the house crazy. Everybody out the house is crazy. When you don't get sleep, because you're troubled, your body is just like on the edge because it's not getting the proper things that it needs, which is the rest. And your troubles, a lot of times, is more magnified if you're not getting proper rest. Not saying they aren't magnified, but if you have a little problem, it can look like it's magnified and become a big problem. But if you have a big problem, it's still a big problem. If you, you know, um, weight it with that. Hallelujah. So will the Lord cast off forever and will he be re favorable no more? So you're trying to see where, you know, where are you, God? Uh, have I done anything wrong? Have you shutting up heaven? I'm not getting my prayers answered, Lord. Where are you? Have you been there in your life, amen, where you were just wondering, okay, God, uh, I need you to work this one. Well, we really need him to work all of them because we can't work none of them. Amen. amen? So we're trusting and we're believing God. So we're having this conversation with ourselves. And when you're in that day of trouble, you're going to have a lot of conversation with yourself. But it's, the important part is how you answer yourself. Would you answer yourself based on his word? Because that's what's going to help you to get over. And then we look at the 10th verse that says, And I said, this is my infirmity, but I remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. I will meditate also of all thy work and talk thy doings. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God? as our God. And that's how you got you to gotta talk to yourself. Ain't nobody like our God. He's the one. So when we meditate, we got to empty out what we're thinking and place in what he says. 13 verse, thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. He, who is so great a God as our God? Thou art the God that doeth wonders. Thou shalt declare thy strength among the people. Thou hast with thine arms redeemed thy people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. 16 verses, the water saw thee, O God, the water saw thee. They were afraid. The depths also were troubled. So here we saw the we, we're seeing here later on. Let's go ahead and finish reading out the rest of it. The clouds poured out water. The skies sent out a sound. Thy arrows also went abroad. The voice of thy thunder was in the heaven. The lightnings lightened the world. The earth trembled and shook. 
Thy way is in the sea, and thy path in the great waters, and thy footsteps are not known. Thou ledded thy people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. So he was reminded of the wilderness and the Red Sea, the God that the God that he needed right then is the same God that delivered them. So he knew and believed and trusted that that same God would be the God that would deliver him in his day of trouble. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. So let's look back and glimpse back at what we just went over. We won't read it again. So in our day of trouble, we need to, like the, verse, the first verse says, we need to cry out to God with our voice, surrender it all, believe God, and trust him. Now, in 2018, a lot of times we as the church, our cry, we don't cry out to God, we do something else to handle our, when we're in our day of trouble. And some of the things that we do is retail shopping. You're so frustrated. I got to get out the house. It doesn't matter what store I go to, as long as I go buy something. Because we know how we do. I need something to make me feel good. So I'm going to hit the store. I ain't got no plan. I ain't got no list or anything, but I'm going to do me some shopping. And that retail therapy, it works till you get back home or till you see that person again. <laughs> Because you'll be shopping all your life <laughs> if you don't deal with it. Retail therapy, it'll get you for a few seconds, but that's not it. Not the answer. That's not what we do in the day of trouble. Can you agree on that? Well, some people think that you, in your day of trouble, you're supposed to numb your brain. So you give me some substance. Uh, Sister Bert, are you talking about the church? I'm still talking about the church. We have the ones that do it. I don't do it unless I have a season of trouble. So I go get me some bubblies, or I go smoke something. Or we can say, I'm going to turn TV on and absorb TV all day and all night because I just got to get beyond this situation. But guess what? When you turn the TV off, you still got the situation. Amen. Amen. Then we have social media. Well, I'm just going to vent out on social media because I'm having the time. I'm in my day of trouble. And somebody's got to know what I'm feeling. And those people going to say stuff to you, and they don't even care about your situation. Oh, sister, yeah, you know, you know, you're going through. But all they're going to do is dump on you their situation. So now you have more situations because your situation, they act like they don't even care about your situation, and they don't. They just want to talk about their situation. Have you ever had anybody with you? You're just trying to, you know, I'm sharing with a brother or sister, and I just want you to come in agreement, and they ain't said a prayer to the day. All they want to do is grab your hand and tell you about their, their walls are falling down. But that's not what you can. Let me have my moment. Because the devil wants you to have your moment when you're going through a trial and trouble. Hallelujah. Some of the times we as believers want to stay in the bed. We'd be broke, but we're in the bed. That's not the way that we resolve the problems. We have to take them to the Lord. Some people in the, in the church believe that uh, the more intimate they are, it takes care of their problems. That don't take care of your problem. It just takes care of your flesh. Amen. Some people have this vocabulary that they feel take care of their problem. And it's not words that we say as believers or should not be saying as a believer. And cursing does not take care of your problem. And here's the one that we might all relate to in the church. Food therapy. <laughs> I can relate to that one really good. I love to cook. So, <laughs> when I had issues, or the church had issues, it was time for me to bake, or throw me some pig feet in a crock pot. <laughs> <laughs> I just sit down and just like, mm -hmm. you know how we do when we get something really good? 
We make them sounds of release. <laughs> but there is a, a chemical release in your body when you do eat certain foods. So that release of that chemical is being released. And that's why people say when you're aggravated, you go get comfort food. It works, but for a season. <laughs> till that plate is gone. <laughs> and then you're back in there trying to find something. I need some chocolate. Give me some chocolate. <laughs> Bring me some chocolate. I need to smother myself up. Then after that, when it's time for you to go somewhere, you put on your outfit, and now you got more troubles. Because you got to go to the store to buy another outfit. Because you sat on that couch, you watched that TV, you stayed in the bed, you, you went and did something you shouldn't have been drinking or, or smoking, you, you only did a short shopping trip, so you didn't get much exercise, so you're... <laughs> All that comfort food and them sweets and desserts are just hanging on to you as well. So those aren't the things that will get us to that place that we need to get. But crying out will. Because when we cry out, we release. And when that baby is in that crib or in that um, bassinet, playpen, or whatever they, wherever they are, when they're cry crying out, they're releasing the stress that's in their bodies. When we cry out to, the, to God, we're releasing all our troubles, and we're saying, God, I can't take this anymore. I release it. I, God, I don't have the answer. I release it. And truth is, we don't have the answers. But God does. So as that baby is emptying his or herself, we need to empty ourselves before the Lord. We're emptying our minds of the thoughts and, and the because immediately the enemy is going to load you up with thoughts. And we're filling them with the thoughts and the words and the laws of God. Amen? His word. And that will be what will get us over and get us to our destination. So, cry out. Because we as born begin believers, we have privileges and benefits because of the blood of Jesus and because we are in right standing with God. So in those uh, areas, when trouble comes, it should not affect us the way it affects others that aren't believers. So we shouldn't be going and getting, I saw a commercial, so this is how I know it. What is it, the blue goose? I was going like, why at Christmas time, every time you turn around, you see an alcohol all on TV? I was going like, so you're going to, they have an alcohol called the Blue Goose. <laughs> I guess they were hallucinating during that time when they were drinking the Blue Goose, amen, or the Goose or whatever it is. But uh, trouble doesn't do us the way it does the world. And that's because of our inheritance, like I said just a few minutes ago, that we have with the Lord. And we have that assurance that when we go before the throne room, he hears us. And that's what it was mentioning here. I think it was around the second voice, uh, verse that in our day of trouble, you might not feel like you comforted because it might not look like it's happening, but we have that assurance from his word that God hears us and he will answer us. And God said he'll never leave us nor forsake us. He will deliver us even in the midst of our troubles. He will go before us. And we don't want crop failure by speaking the wrong words. So that's why we meditate on his word. Like it's mentioned, uh, I think it was around the fourth verse. A little bit farther, I'm sorry. Twelfth verse. We meditate on his word. We remember what he says. And then we proclaim that as well. Praise the Lord. Um, trouble doesn't do us the way that it does the world or it shouldn't. And cry, it, cry is different than prayer. Because when you're in distress, you cry out. When you're back against the wall, you cry out because you don't know what to do. It's a, it's a different type of surrender. A lot of times in prayer, we don't always surrender. But when you cry out, it's just like you are, 
you're, you're, at, you're back against the wall and you really, really don't know which direction to go. And that cry is your exit. And then you go in prayer, but you, you releasing, you releasing, you releasing and you trust in God. And when we cry, it's a louder utterance. It's a shout for help because you are in deep distress. And when we cry, it also means that we're in a position of humility. Because there's nothing you can do about it. The only help you're going to get is from the Lord. So when we're crying, there's things we can't fix. And that's what we got to do when it comes to life. There are things we can't fix. There's things we can mess up, but there are things that we can't fix. So the creator, our father, our God, the one that made us and knows all about us, knows our beginnings and the ends, has all the answers, that's the one that can do the fixing. Amen? So we release it, we cry out of humility, and we humble ourselves and we exalt him. The cry also represents unconditional surrender. Because you want God to come to your defense. Amen? And when you cry out, you're letting God know, I'm going to do exactly what you say for me to do. Now there's a cry that there's a shout for joy after you release it. Because that's your worship. That's your praise. God, and hey, you know what? When you think about it, who wouldn't shout for joy after that? I don't release this to you, God. I'm, I don't have no weights. The weights are released. Do it said you, you won't have the situation? Will it not be in front of you? It's going to still be there. But the way I see it is going to be different than the way I see, saw it before I cried out to the Lord. So that way it's not overtaking me. A cry is also a plea for mercy from God. Oh, God, I need you. Lord, come on the scene. Take over. Take complete control. It confirms your faith in God's power and in his promises when we cry out. A cry recognizes that we are helpless and in need of help, just like that baby. Because there are things, like we said, that you, can, you think you can fix, but he's the one that is the fixer. Trouble can come. Trouble is sent your way. And it comes from a lot of different so sources and a lot of different places. But when it comes to our troubles, those trials, those situations, there's victory in Christ Jesus. And we are to enter that place of rest and trust him. And that's the only way you're going to get that peace because if not, it's the enemy will keep you on the edge. But when you enter into that rest, that place that you say, God, I can't do this. I trust you, God. I done lost my hair behind it. Now, I've been there. And I'm still in a little season. So <laughs> I woke up this morning and said, Jesus, I know you numbered the hairs on my head. You know all of them, Jesus. But this little El Pacho back here, somebody or something is just getting me in the night season. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not figuring out what's going on. But whatever it is, Jesus, I release it to you because I need my hair. The enemy told me, said, girl, you had that 60 thing. I said, bald eagles belong to birds. <laughs> I'm not a bird. I just got like, Lord Jesus, I hold on to every strand in Jesus' name. Whew. And I don't know about you, but it's something about your hair and a woman. Do anybody have these issues other than me? I was just, uh, I was going to like, okay. Hold on. Maybe I need to sing some hold on songs. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Mm. But if that was my time of trouble, he still, he 
still has the answer. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. And you can rest in it. That he's going to put back every follicle, make every follicle work, every hair grow, give it the proper nutrition that it needs. Keep my hand out of my head in the middle of the night in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. He is the one with the answer. Hallelujah. And we have to enter that rest. We have to stay in that place of rest and trust in him. And he'll walk us through. He'll carry us when we need to be carried. I've had challenges in my life that I, if I know there is a God. Because he carried me in the midst of the storms. He delivered me in my day of trouble. So I'm talking out of experience. And I'm still experiencing some things. Amen? And that's life. If you think trouble won't find you, it will find you. It has your address. And the enemy will make sure you get your, you get your package. And you won't even see the box when it comes. Because the next thing you know is going to like, who is he? Who is she? Where they come from? But He's, he's trying to break us off our relationship with God because we're not ignorant of Satan's device and devices. Amen. So we wait on the Lord. He is our key. And we keep on serving the Lord. And that's the whole thing. The enemy wants us off our commitment with the Lord. He wants us off the word of God. He wants to keep us so occupied and busy that we don't have time to hear God's voice and obey him. And I remember when I was having a season of trouble. Now, I don't mean a light season. I'm talking about a blizzard. There were snowstorms so frequent that a lot of times you couldn't even get it. Get, it just so like you couldn't even gather your thoughts. I was going to lie. Oh, no. And then it affects the way you respond to people. Because you can have so much trouble. You think the ones that love you is the ones that is your enemy too. Because you're seeing them different because you so weighted down. And I remember I just had to kind of push myself in the night season. I said, okay, it's not working in the daytime. He's wearing me out in the daytime. I'm putting out fires in the daytime. It's co stuff coming from every direction and et cetera. But I had to learn to pull myself out that bed in the midnight hour when everything was quiet and still, and just get before God and say, Lord, this situation I release to you, and I found what his word says about it. And the next situation, I did the same thing. Then eventually, I started speaking his word, and I wasn't moved by what I saw. It got worse. But I had to come to a place, do I receive it and respond and let it kill me or do I fight with the word of God? And that's what I had to do. I had to go into the fight mode. And it still was a long season. But the snow didn't come as heavy and the outside temperatures weren't as cold like it was when I first, before I started it. So there is a push for the word. And that's what the enemy is trying to do is to rob us of God's word and the relationship that we have to try to destroy the relationship that we have with the Lord. But I know that as women of God, there's a bulldog on the inside that says, not so, devil. Amen? Because we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. So let's rest in him because he is our peace. And you, you know, if you think about some of the family members that we had back in the day, I love them ladies and, and, and men of God that used to be, when they were in that season of trouble, what did they do? They did that, but some of them weren't saved, so what did they do? <laughs> Didn't they sing to the Lord? A lot of them, you know, they might have had, Look, they might have had uh, brothers and sisters or, or, or family members or spouses or whatever that would aggravate them to the T. 
But they would get in that kitchen and sing, what a friend we have in Jesus. And them kids didn't know they were having issues because they were singing it out because they might not knew how to get into the word. But they knew to keep Jesus in the forefront of this. I can't do this by myself. I got to call on Jesus. And they helped them keep their sanity. That was their cry out. In a, way, in a way, because a lot of them didn't have the word or they didn't know to go to the word or how to use the word. They didn't even know salvation at that point. Some of them did, some of them didn't. But they had some songs that were full of the word of God that helped them to get to that place that they need to get to with God. And some of them, when they were having difficult times, they were singing, Blessed Assurance. Jesus is mine. So they, they were just reinforcing the one that is going to be the one that's going to help me in my time of trouble. And it kept them focused. They kept the song in their spirit so that they wouldn't be overcome by the enemy. Hallelujah. So when they, the conflicts are in our lives, how do we respond? How will we respond is the question. We'll just continue to pray and cry out and seek God and speak his word and sing praises to him, even in the night season, because that's where a lot of times your biggest challenge is going to be in the night season. Hallelujah. And how we handle trouble determines how well we grow. Can I say that again? How we handle trouble determines how well we grow. Now, all of y'all know I love gardening. And we know that the word of God is representative of the seed. And the seed has life. I can take any kind of seed I have in my house and lay it on the soil. It's going to eventually produce something. It's just a matter of how, how long. What the kitchen, no matter what the conditions are, if it's protected good enough, it's still going to grow. So if a storm comes, if there's snow and et cetera, but if the environment is right, it's going to grow. Trouble, if it gets the right nutrients, it's going to grow. That's one that you want crop failure on. You don't want growth. You want crop failure. You need to dig up that seed. Get the roots. Kill it. <laughs> And you can do that with the word of God because that's the only way you're going to get that root up is by the word of God and applying the truths of God on that situation and standing and resting in him because trouble wants to destroy us, not grow us. It wants to destroy us. So in our day of trouble, let's continue to seek the Lord. Let's continue to press in. Let's continue to seek his face in the midst of trouble. And when that second verse was talking about the sore, I can imagine they were talking about that pain. There is a pain when you're in trouble. You're in your season of trouble or in that time of trouble. There's that pain, but... The pain that you have a lot of times when you're in that time of trouble will run even into the night season. And so that's why you're not getting that rest. And that's why he was saying he couldn't get the rest because of that pain, that sore from all the trouble he was experiencing. But God can give us peace and comfort and rest in the midst of a storm. Hallelujah. And then the third verse said that he remembered. You have to reflect back and think about the things that God has delivered you from. Because the, the murmuring and complaining that they did didn't get them out the wilderness. The murmuring and complaining didn't get them on the other side of the Red Sea. It was the trust in God and believe in God. And we just thank God for that. And the fourth verse says that your eyes 
were awake. So we were talking about that, that staying awake all night and your mind can't settle down because of the trouble that you're in. And a lot of times when our mind can't settle down too, is it F-E-A-R? It can't be T-R-U-S-T. Because he gives us peace. And so when we can't settle down, I can about tell you this works for me. If you read the word, you'll settle down and go to sleep. You get both because he doesn't want you to get it. So let's go from being troubled in our hearts and in our minds to being settled so we can receive the peaceful sleep that he desires for us. And so God gives us gifts, which is the sweet sleep and the rest and the peace. But we have to make sure we don't take these, don't have the gift and leave it unopened. He gives the gifts, but we have to open it. Because a gift left unopened doesn't do anybody any good. And we know that the bottom line is the thief cometh but to steal, kill, and destroy. And Jesus said that I have come to give life and give life more abundantly. He's here to give us more peace in the midst of our trouble, more comfort, more power, more joy in the midst of whatever troubles we are f addressing or looking at. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse 15 says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up, troubles you, and defile many, and many be defiled. And when we're in that trouble, we have to make sure that there's not a root of bitterness that our enemy will try to use in that process through anger or frustration. So forgiveness is a good thing. And the good thing about forgiveness is it's for us more so than that person because when we do it, it releases us. That person has to do it for themselves. We do it for ourselves. There's a benefit. But when they do it, they get a benefit too as well. So there's a, there's a trap that the enemy sets for offense. And that trap is when we re refuse to release it and refuse to forgive and let it go. So there's nothing we can do about some things. So we have to let it go. Because we know that if we don't, the wound is going to come and it's going to affect us. And many will be affected because we're affected. So we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. So that might be the plan. Sometimes we got to look and say, okay, what is behind all this? What? We're not ignorant of Satan's devices. Maybe I need to just fast and pray and get before God so I can see what the plot is behind it. Because that way you'll know what the root is. Where the enemy is trying to go with this? Who is he really after? Sometimes when he hit us, it's not us he's trying to get. It's the ones that can't fight for themselves. Or the ones that don't have the wisdom or the level of knowledge that we have. And so if he figures he can knock that person down, then he'll get the whole house or he'll get the whole church or he'll get the whole company. Not so. Romans, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me. We know that Satan wants to create a hellish life for us, and he's going to do everything he possibly can to make sure that we don't have the life with Christ that we're having. He's not happy we, we're not with him. He knows. Do you know what? I knew what it was like to be close to God. Now I'm not, and I'm not going to get this back. I'm not going to be happy for y'all. <laughs> so I'm going to make it just as uncomfortable for you all as I possibly can. You know, but whatever he tries, God's already made provision for us. He's already given us the answer. He's always given us a way of escape. It's already there, and it's already done. 
So Romans the 12th chapter verse 18 says, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peacefully with all men. So in other words, we can create an atmosphere, but you cannot control their will. One of my situations that, I, that I'll share is, I remember having a person that was like a thorn in the flesh for me. They lied on me, they were saying things about me, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, they had a little team that was believing them. And uh, did it hurt? Yeah, because I allowed that person in my inner circle. And so when they went out so in discord and gossiping and lying and saying things and I mean cruel and ugly things and et cetera, I had to create an atmosphere in a sense that do I allow them to upset my entire house or, my, or the church that I go to because that would empower them if I allowed them to have that much power. They ain't getting that kind of power. So, you can be like that lady. You can sing your little song around them, and them little spirits get, <laughs> they get agitated. If they want to come in your presence or whatever, take them in your office, have your word going forth. They're going to eventually get the hint. They'll get the point. They're going to either get it right or get out. And they always work. Because the word will never return void. But, the, but you know, when, even when you address people about that, they don't understand that when they sow those types of things, they're going to reap. Mm -hmm. And the reaping's going to be hard. So why would you continue to go in the wrong direction in that way? And we as believers, when people do things or say things about us, there is a big consequence that they're going to pay. So we can warn them, uh, you know, I think you might want to watch your words. I think you might want to not be doing this. I think you don't want to be saying that because they will see those seeds will come up. And they're going to produce a fruit. And there is a fruit that will probably rob everything they have. But sometimes people think because I'm in the land of plenty, it ain't going to happen. It's never going to happen when you think it's going to happen. It's when you least expect it. It's when it's going to tear your door down. And you're going to say, where did that come from? And you're going to be reminded of something you said 20 years ago, 30 years ago. But they'll see it before they leave here. I believe it. Hallelujah. So be careful. Uh, Colossians, the third chapter, verse 8 says, but now you also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, Blaspheme, filthy communication out of your mouth. Because those things will offend. Those things will destroy. And if we allow those things, it will take control of us. Because when we're anger, when there's anger there, it's an agitation to your soul. And one thing about anger, anger and lust, they, they like twin towers to me. They both are out of control in the heat of the moment, mm -hmm. and they will destroy you. Wrath is sort of like your anger just boiling up, and uh, then it f goes down. Then it comes back up, and then it goes back down sometimes. You have that kind of rage or that intense anger that's there, and a lot of times with... Uh, with that, it rises up when you least expect it. And um, that's, when, that's why people lose it in the midst of it. Because they have suppressed it or it's, it's laying dormant to somebody or something irritates them and it rises up. A lot of times when people, uh, I've noticed that a lot of people that we have ministered to or seen people minister to or heard other pastors say minister to, a lot of people have had situations from their childhood to flow up in their relationship. And what I mean by that is if, you're, if your father, for a girl, if your father didn't treat you right, then sometimes it affects how the girls treat their husband. 
So if the if the guy's mother didn't treat him right, it affects how he treats his wife. So those kind of things are come back up. A lot of times they'll lie dormant until they get married or until they're in a relationship. And then you see, well, you know, they, they get to a point, certain parts in the relationship they can't go forward in because of that area. But God can heal that area and he can fix that area. How many, how many like marinating steaks and, and uh, different types of meat and et cetera, and then you get ready to put it on the grill and it's a cold day like today and you got your charcoal out there and you put your lighter fluid there. Well, a lot of times, sometimes we can get impatient with our, with our uh, waiting, but if you light that grill, you throw that match and that lighter fluid on that charcoal and you don't give it the ample amount of time, it's going to blow. You're going to see all that fire. And you're going to be so happy you see that fire and we're ready to put the steak on, et cetera. But guess what? It's going out. Because it didn't have the proper time to soak. So that's how wrath is. It comes up. It blows somebody out. And it's over. Then next thing you know, as soon as they see somebody, somebody could just look like that person or be in that person's family. All of a sudden, that the head starts. Spinning, they ready to get them. You know, like, ooh, ooh. It's being stroked because it wasn't dealt with. And until you get the root out, it'll it'll keep coming up. And it'll cause them to blow off. Malice that we saw in Colossians is long-lasting bitterness. It's when we can become hateful. That shouldn't be in the body of Christ, should it? Mean, evil disposition. Always looking for the worst in other people. And some people don't even want their children ever to get married because they cannot see. And it mostly happened with women. Their sons can't marry nobody. I ain't gonna, never going to marry nobody as long as their fingers are on the pulse. And that's, that's, a, that's a spirit of witchcraft, really, because it's manipulation and et cetera. So we all have kids. We all think. Highly of our kids, but we're not supposed to be evil. And that's a spirit that the Greek word for uh, that is diablos. And that's called devil. <laughs> we hear people say, you're acting like the devil. That's what spirit they're talking about. That long-lasting bitterness and that hateful spirit. And then when you see that people are offended, they won't let it go. You can have stuff for 20 years. You're going to see these people, these people for forever, annually, at least one time out of year, and you're still holding on. You done been in their presence, and you haven't gotten that dealt with. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. Amen? Something's really, really wrong. So nobody should have to pay for un unresolved issues in our lives. And in closing, some visible signs of um, being in anger is we're irritable. People can say, are you okay? Are you all right? And we're irritable just by them saying it. <laughs> Smile, lighten up. Sometimes people could be irritable because they're in deep thought. I give you that one. <laughs> if you believe it. <laughs> you could be impatient. You just don't have any tolerance for people when you are in that mode of being anger. And that anger is what's going to hold us back in our day of trouble. It'll hold us hostage. Another visible sign of anger is our voice tone. Our voice can sound harsh or can be raised. Another one is those glaring eyes that penetrate in intense facial muscles. Hey, Amen. <laughs> and people just say, well, you need to tell your face. I've been accused of not being looking at somebody like I'm mad, but they just said, don't. <laughs> I've heard adults say, please don't stare at me. And I was kind of like, I didn't know I was staring. <laughs> <laughs> but 
but it didn't. But I wasn't. But I found out that even sometimes I might have some conversation going on in my head and I'm looking in that direction and it's just like I'm getting downloaded some stuff and I'm just locked in because I don't want to move and et cetera because I'm hearing things. And people said, I had the kids who used to tell me in the youth uh, ministry, Sister Burke, please don't look at us. And I said, why? What do you mean? I didn't realize I was looking at you. I apologize. They said, it's like you reading through us. <laughs> and I was kind of like, oh, yeah? And I was saying, hey, if it works. If it works for you, but what it was, they knew I knew. I didn't know as much as they thought I knew, <laughs> but they gave it away. <laughs> so if the spirit of conviction come upon you, let it roll. But it was going to like, it's like you know what we do. And like this was before MySpace and social media or whatever. But, you know, even if you know something about someone and et cetera, that don't mean you're supposed to tell everything you know. Unless God tells you. Keep it. And just intercede. And pray. Amen? Another visible sign of anger or malice is hateful words. We have to remember nobody, and I do say nobody, nobody can make you mad. You have control of that. So when we're saying hateful words, like you get on my nerves, why do you always do this? I'm tired of you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those words get on the inside, and your, your soul can't heal itself like your body. And let's say that again, your soul can't heal itself like your body. That's why we got to really be careful and watch our words, and that's why it's mentioned in Scripture, put a watch over our mouths, Speak words of life, things that'll build us. Those are words that we need to say. I remember uh, family members and old, older people used to say, if you ain't got nothing good to say about anybody, don't say nothing. They knew wisdom because we do give account for our words. Praise the Lord. So we also, another sign is there's a disconnect. We could be sarcastic, aggressive where you got people that will take you out and smile while they doing it. And some people you can see, you don't see no visible sign, but you look on the side of the head, you see that big old juggle vein or that vein sticking out up here or that juggle vein sticking out over here, you know they're mad. But they'll say, no, I'm not mad. Or they have this, this heavy breathing And you go like, okay, they're not saying anything, but they are still breathing, it's kind of heavy. So you'll know, you'll know. There's a lot of great signs there, so it's there. And then you have that passive aggressive person, that little sweet person that'll cut your head off, and you won't even know you, they cut it. They are there. And then you have that one that's really aggressive that will let you know where they're standing. But it says that when it comes to those areas, we got to release those areas and get rid of them because anger is, those are spirits, all of those are spirits. And, but they are spirits that can be managed, it's not spirits that cannot be managed, it's spirits that can be man, managed and uh, it's by our will. So they will manifest, but we can't control it with the word of God and with prayer and releasing those things to God. So we shouldn't accept it and we should not go along with it. So that anger will affect our bodies. So when we're in our area, uh, in our time of trouble, make sure we release that anger, make sure we let it go. We don't want high blood pressure, we don't want cancer, we don't want dementia, we don't want high cholesterol, we don't want autoimmune diseases, we don't want any cardiovascular diseases, we don't want any sickness and disease. So God give us wisdom and grace, and that's what we need for every situation, is his wisdom, his grace. 
and he will help us in any unresolved anger. If there's some anger there that you might not even know, and sometimes other people know you are when you don't even know you are. And sometimes there are things that are in your past that you don't even know is there that's causing a problem. But sometimes other people can see it when you won't even know it too as well. So stay in the mode of forgiving people in the midst of trouble and even when we're not in trouble because even if they were right or even if they were wrong, just forgive them and let it go because this is what Jesus wants us to do. And we, in closing, want the character of God. So we're not going to get stuck in the spirit of the enemy. Amen? Did I help you any today? I pray that it did, that in your day of trouble, that you'll remember to cry out to him, that you'll release those things and not hold on to them in the night season because they can't affect you, that you will get to that place that you'll trust God and believe God and know and rehearse Everything that he has done in your past, you just think on those things, and that would encourage our hearts to go forth. And if you cry out, you cry out to God first, but you can't cry out to people that you know will stand in the gap with you, and they will go on your behalf. And so let's pray and just let's give God praise for his answer. When we're in the tr area of trouble, we're in that place of God. Let us pray, Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, that you are our deliverer. You are a helper, oh God, and we cry out to you, God. We release, oh God, all that we have in our hearts and in our minds, the weights, oh God, that are too hard for us to carry, oh God, and you didn't equip us to carry it, God. We release them all to you, oh God, and Father, we surrender any anger, any malice, any bitterness, God, any strife, oh God, that we might have been holding, any unforgiveness, God, we release it to you, oh God, and we ask that you'll give us everything we need, God, to be and to do all that you desire for us to do. And God, we thank you for the answers that you have, God. We thank you, Father, for the victory in that situation, oh God, and we give you praise, oh God. We thank you, Father, that you give us strength to stand in the midst of the storm and in the midst of our trouble, oh God. We ask, oh God, that you'll continue to speak to our hearts, even in the night season, oh God. We thank you, Father, for your head, your protection, God, that you are the one, oh God, that will guide us and protect us and keep us. Lord, we ask that you just hold us in the palm of your hand and we receive it with thanksgiving. We thank you, Father, that there's victory in you, oh God. And we thank you, Father, that we surrender it all to you. And we give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And amen.